I have been in a relationship with my wife for 15 years, and we have been married for about 12 years. We have two sons, one biological and one who I consider my own in every sense. My wife and I met at a cookout hosted by some mutual friends. She had come with my friend's wife. They had collaborated at the time. We hit it off that day, and I assumed we had been inseparable ever since. Recently, something has changed. There has been an increasing distance between us, an invisible wall that appears to be getting thicker by the day. I couldn't pinpoint when or why it started, but I could feel it in the way she looked at me and paused before speaking. We didn't seem to be communicating well. She'd walk upstairs to read her book, and I'd stay below for myself. She'd go out to see her friends more frequently, leaving me to care for the boys. I couldn't recall the last time we had a genuine chat that wasn't about the kids or some dull housework. It seemed as if we were going through the motions of being married without truly connecting. A few weeks ago, I dropped my wife off at her last appointment while I went for a quick runaround. When I got back, I realized she had left her phone in the car. I knew she'd be back in at least 20 minutes later. A notification flashed up. It was my stepson, even if I have no idea how to utilize Snapchat. I felt it would be hilarious to send him a note from me rather than his mother. After sending, I sent him a funny picture back. I stumbled into my wife's conversation section. At first, it appeared to be nothing. I want to put down the phone. But then I saw a name. A name I have always despised. I will call him Louis. At first, I hesitated. I never wanted to be the type of person that intrudes on someone's privacy by peeking at their phone. I never expected to be that person when it came to my wife. But then again, I never expected to be where I am now. Curiosity got the best of me, and what I saw stunned me to the core. She'd kept intimate images of them together. There were naked images of both him and her. There were videos. They had saved chats concerning improper behavior. Without going into detail, let's just say it included oral sex, despite the evident betrayal. I couldn't stop reading, but the scattered dates and scarce facts from the past made it tough to piece together the entire plot. But my curiosity prompted me to keep using Snapchat. Certain pieces would automatically disappear. This brought an additional layer of complication to the problem. What actually happened? I needed to know. It was eating me up inside. According to my observations, things began to happen a few times in recent months, including on my birthday while I slept upstairs. She had prepared a surprise party for me because it marked an important milestone. I ended up getting too drunk and heading upstairs to sleep while the rest of the visitors remained downstairs. I suppose you had invited him over. She knew I wouldn't wake up because I was so inebriated when the last visitors left. He dipped in and the way she spoke about me was particularly terrible. It was rarely positive and frequently only partially accurate. However, some assertions are clearly untrue or deceptive. I'm not sure why it was kept, but she told him I was a bad lover who was no longer interested in her, which is completely false. I want to think I still had my energy and stamina. We were intimate around two or three times per week on average. Even though she had been acting strangely towards me for a time, it all made sense now. I think, looking back, I've spent the most of my time pleasing her. Nothing wrong with that. I enjoy making my wife happy but sometimes it's wonderful to receive something in return. And now that I think about it, that hasn't happened in a long time. Then I read that she is horrified by me and hates me touching her. So the salon door opens and she speaks out, smiles, and waves me in. Was I able to afford to pay for that for her? I was stunned, dumbfounded. I didn't smile back, but I recall making care to close the discussion she was having with Lewis, so it didn't appear like I was snooping around. I returned the phone to its original location before proceeding into the salon. The kicker was that the last lady told me that my wife had said how wonderful a husband I was and how she wished she had a husband like mine who treated her so well. I had to smile and giggle. What could she have been telling me, this lady, when I was reading something really earth-shattering minutes ago? I couldn't contain myself any longer until we arrived at our car. I unloaded all the details to her, making sure she understood not to touch her phone until we could talk about it. We screamed and yelled as we drove home. When we arrived, I immediately started looking into the problem. She hesitated, but eventually handed me her unlocked phone. It was a difficult talk from then on out. 
We argued again, with her denying and then admitting until she finally gave in. She said that she had felt abandoned and unwanted, but that this was not a justification to cheat. It was a confession that left me feeling hurt, deceived, and puzzled. I couldn't comprehend how things had gotten so out of control. Then I wondered if I had been so preoccupied with my own ambitions that I had overlooked hers. Had I unintentionally pushed her toward Lewis's arms? I had questioned her about Lewis in an attempt to determine the depth of their relationship. My wife reacted by stating that they had been chatting and emailing nudes for months, but had never slept together. She insisted that it had always been a sexting connection and nothing else. I informed her that based on the communications she had exchanged with Lewis, it was difficult to believe. On my birthday, she disclosed to her infidelity with Lewis in her own home. She claimed that they had intercourse in the basement's spare bedroom. And then there was a time when she claimed to have gone on a hike with a girlfriend, just to meet up with him instead. And they had sex off the route, in the middle of the bush. My heart dropped to my feet as she confessed. I tried to keep calm, but my rage and pain poured over. I had always been there for her, supporting her family and devoting my personal time to her and our lads. How could she have done this to me? How could you toss away everything we'd created together? Things get better. I needed to know everything. As we progressed through the chat, I continued to probe and ask any questions that came to mind. She wasn't crying. More and more was discovered. Now this leads me to Lewis. Before we met, she was seeing Lewis. I never liked this man. She would bring him up from time to time, and common friends would do the same, and I despised it. She would make passing remarks about him from time to time. Looking back, I should have known, but hindsight is always twenty-twenty. What I did know was that she saw him behind my stepson's biological father. Apparently, when she became pregnant, she had no idea who my stepson's real father was, which is why the biological father fled and abandoned her. She continued to see Lewis for a short time after that, but he left her high and dry with my lovely son right before his birth. She eventually got a paternity test because she wanted financial support from my stepson's biological father, and it was confirmed that he was the father, not Lewis. As soon as she said those words, my mind raced, and I asked her about every possible occasion in which she may have cheated. The majority of the examples were trivial, with the exception of one that stuck out many years ago before we even married. She didn't get home until around 2 a.m. after work one night. I asked where she had been, but she only responded she had gone out. Despite my misgivings, I dismissed them due to my inexperience in a new relationship. However, it had always been in the back of my mind and surfaced again on that particular night as I asked her, attempting to control my emotions, which were a mix of rage and hurt. She instantly became anxious. Now the waterworks begin. Tears began spilling down her cheeks. She admits to having drinks with a male co-worker who had been flirting with her. She informed him she was unmarried at the time, and they went for drinks before making out in his car in the bar's parking lot. I couldn't believe what I heard. The lies, treachery, years of secrets, and grief from the past were all coming back to haunt us. It felt as if a lifetime of love and trust had been crushed in few hours of discovering the truth. I'm not sure who I was speaking to anymore, and now I'm here, writing this. My wife left for the weekend so that we could have some space. She apparently has a girlfriend's residence, but I'm not even sure. I informed her that if I found out she went to Lewis's apartment, the marriage would be finished, and this would be ended. She claims she won't. But who knows? Who knows what is true anymore? This weekend I'll be able to keep myself busy by accompanying the boys to their volleyball games. But I am at a loss here. It appears that every direction I look is the wrong one. I do not want to lose my wife. I do not want to lose my boys. I adore my family more than anything. However, I refuse to sit back and be taken advantage of, to be made to feel tiny and tricked, only to shrug it off and pretend it didn't bother me. I feel absolutely alone and confused what to do. So I took a chance and came here despite my lack of understanding on the issue. I can't stop thinking about what she told Louis. I feel completely emasculated. So I filed for divorce. Given how this appears to be a disturbing trend, I wasn't lying when I claimed I discovered she ran straight to Lua. This was it. I just need to figure out how to keep my boys. Being a father is the best thing that has happened to me. At one point, I shot images of the talks they and we had. 
I'm collecting evidence just in case. And keep her honest. You can also edit. I believe I need to take a break and process everything until tomorrow. This has all been a bit much for me to bear right now, but I'd like to thank everyone for their thoughts and advice. Even those who think my fate is to be a cuckold. I expected individuals to have diverse and passionate viewpoints, which is exactly what I wanted to hear. Others' perspectives. It's just tough to understand that my marriage could end so abruptly after spending half of my life developing it. If anything changes, I will post an update. That's definitely one way to find out. Your wife has been keeping secrets like a squirrel collecting nuts for winter, and Louis, the enigmatic character lurking in the shadows of your marriage, makes unexpected appearances like a reoccurring villain in a lousy movie sequel. Who needs Netflix when you have this much suspense at home? At the very least, you have your priorities straight. Documenting every scandal is a detail, even if it is difficult to read. Update. One Monday morning, my wife returned home. She gets ready and I attempt to stay cool and casual. Before she leaves for work, inquire as to where she spent the weekend. I happened to be working from home that day. She told me it was Natalia, a female co-worker, since she was too embarrassed to tell our mutual acquaintances that we had a fight and didn't want to tell them what it was about. She says she wants to mend it but does not want everyone to know. She said, we can fix this. I suspected she wouldn't tell me the truth. There were a couple ladies she was close to at work. One of them has become a dear friend of mine as well, and I never imagined she'd go there to air our dirty laundry. She has mentioned the other several times. I know she's a genuine person since we've gone on a few double dates with whoever she's now seeing. She cannot keep a boyfriend. She is continually dating someone new. And every time my wife says she's going out for drinks with the girls, she shows up, so I know she's a fantastic fun, but also a horrible influence. So if anyone was going to grumble about marriage and try it out, it would have been her. So I am not proud of it. But I go to Facebook, discover Natalia's page, and message her there. I kind of lie and say that I wanted to schedule a wonderful date night with my wife next weekend. And I was hoping Natalia could come along and invite anyone. I also go in and say, I hope you and my wife had a good time this weekend. She returns and says she'd love to hang out, but then quickly adds that she has no idea what I'm talking about. She claims she's been out of town for a funeral, but will be back in time for our date night next weekend. And then I realized my wife had lied again. I sat there, stunned, staring at my phone as I read Natalia's response. My heart is racing. I attempted to make sense of the facts. She'd lied to me again. It was like a knife twisting in my stomach. I could not believe the magnitude of her deception. I felt a rush of rage go through my veins. How could she do this to me and her family? I believed we were equal partners in this marriage, but now I'm wondering if I ever truly knew her. Okay, it's over. She stated she didn't want everyone to know. I took up the phone and contacted my brother, who had just been through something similar. I told him what occurred, and I am not scared to admit that I cried. I couldn't let my wife continue to lie and manipulate me. It was time to take charge of my life and defend my family. He gave her the information to his lawyer, and I promptly emailed him. His assistant responded straight quickly, and I got things started. I stated that I want joint custody of my children and outlined the scenario. I told my brother not to inform anyone just yet since I wanted to settle things and really hit her where it hurts before anyone found out. Smooth movement. OPI. Congrats on your quick decision to name me Cavalry because nothing says I'm done with your lies, like calling the lawyer and using the D-word. Your wife's lies are like a slap in the face, leaving you reeling with astonishment and betrayal, from inventing stories about innocent outings to making complex excuses. She has mastered the art of deception with remarkable ease. Update 2 a few weeks later, I received a call from the lawyer's office informing me that the divorce was ongoing and that I should gather all relevant information and paperwork. I felt relieved knowing that I was taking the appropriate precautions to safeguard myself and my family during this time. I also sought aid from a therapist to deal with the emotional upheaval I was experiencing. He also stated that I had a decent chance of keeping my children if they decided to stay with me. That also terrified me since I thought we were all so close. I don't want my kids to have to pick between their mother and father. This is all meant to be very private. I wanted to make sure I had everything covered before handing her the paperwork since I was unsure how she would react. So I was essentially waiting for the appropriate opportunity, 
Some of you may believe I was dragging it out, but I wasn't. There was a method to this madness. Yes. Throughout everything, I continued to act as if I wanted to make things right with my wife. I couldn't give her any indication that I wanted to terminate things. So I played along. I attempted to play house to the best of my ability, but there was a sticky situation that occurred while trying to keep things secret. Things, in fact, did not remain secret. My brother, of course, informed both his wife and his wife. Then I kind of spilled the beans to everyone. I wasn't really upset about it, but it eventually got back to my sons because their relatives told them what their mother had done. My son sat me down one day while their mother was away and told me that they knew what was going on with me and my family. They claimed they had my back and that no matter what, they did not want to live with her. I promised them I'd do everything I could to make that happen. Later that day, I decided to deliver my soon-to-be ex the divorce papers, and I presented them to her. She was in astonishment. She couldn't believe I'd taken such severe action and urged me to reconsider. But I stood steadfast in my decision. I made it plain that I wanted to do the best for our children, and so I was prepared to battle for their best interests in the following weeks. The legal process started. We met with our separate lawyers, and the negotiations began. Every day, I felt the weight of the divorce loom over me like a dark cloud, but I felt I needed to be strong for my children. During this time, the boys stayed with me while my soon-to-be ex moved out. You guessed it, she went to reside with Louis. Dot yikes. Your well-prepared plan begins to disintegrate as quickly as a cheap sweater in the washer. Thanks so much. Loose-lipped relatives have turned a clandestine mission into family gossip. Best. And don't forget the emotional shock your sons delivered when they swore their loyalty to Team Dad. Their proclamation that they do not want to live with their mother and that they have your back is quite heartfelt. It reflects the bond you formed with them. Update 3. The boys are with me full-time, which is now legal in court. My ex receives them every other weekend, but only if she moved out of Luisha's place and into her own apartment, which she did. She stayed with Louis for a while longer. She had also abandoned her job, which she had been with for almost ten years, since he stated he had a chance for her to work from home on his business or something similar. However, he was ultimately arrested for tax evasion. I don't know the specifics. Anyway, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. She is unemployed and is currently looking for work. She's asked me for money several times to pay her rent, but I've flatly refused. I believe she is now considering moving back into our family home with her mother and father. She has nowhere else to go. Everyone isn't particularly impressed with her right now. The lads don't want anything to do with her. The divorce proceedings were difficult, and I will not sugarcoat them. Every day was an emotional roller coaster, and I felt as if a big weight was on my chest. My ex tried to bring me down, and there were times when I believed I'd never see the light at the end of the tunnel. But I kept going. Not just for myself, but for my sons. They needed a stable atmosphere, and I knew I had to give it for them. Here is the next story. I suppose every man who has ever been happily married, even for a short period, believes he has the best wife ever. I genuinely can say that. However, for 50 years, Wendy and I were blissfully married, and certainly she was the ideal wife a guy could ever have. I say it was because she is no longer alive. She was diagnosed with a rare non-Hodgkin's lymphoma less than a year ago, the latest in a long string of medical problems that have afflicted her throughout her life. They discovered pockets of illness throughout her belly, particularly around her big intestine, and the doctor told she'd require surgery to go through the rest of her chemotherapy. It would be risky, but if all went well, the doctor indicated she'd be able to continue her chemotherapy and recover from the cancer. But things did not go as planned. The illness had spread farther than they had thought. They had to do more than just remove a portion of her big intestine. They did everything they could, but she did not survive the surgery. I was devastated when they told me the news, but we both realized she might not make it. We also knew she wouldn't survive without surgery, so we decided to give it a shot. I'd just got home from the funeral. A sad affair, but highly attended because everyone who knew her adored her. I sat in my recliner, pulled out our photo album, and reflected on our time together. It may seem unusual, but I met Wendy before meeting my first wife, Marcy. It was 1967, and I had just been posted to my unit at the Marine Corps Base, Camp Pendleton in Southern California. My MOOC occupational specialty was 0311 Infantry. 
One of the guys in my unit set me up on a blind date, so I choose to go. After all, it was far superior to sitting on base. My friend Tony had first hooked me up with Wendy's friend Pat. It turned out, however, that Tony and Pat got along well, so he ended up with her while Wendy and I became acquainted. Her long blonde hair and beautiful features drew me in right away. She had the largest blue eyes I'd ever seen, and her grin could launch a fleet of ships. I'd always been a leg man, her legs. Oh my God, those legs. Whereas today's youth could say to die for, to say I was smitten is an understatement of the year. We spent the evening getting to know each other and realized we had a lot in common. We were both in service, but while I was in the Marines, she was in the Navy and worked as a corpsman at the Naval Hospital in Balboa, the Navy's equivalent of a medic. We both liked the same music and movies, and we had many other interests. Before the night ended, I knew I was going to marry this woman. We dated for a few months before steadily drifting apart. She told me she was concerned that we were becoming too close, so we stopped seeing each other on a regular basis. I was initially heartbroken, but eventually met Marcy, who would become my first wife. Was it ever a mistake? Marcy was initially lovely, sweet, and enjoyable to be with, but it appeared that the moment we got married, the mask fell off, and I found myself waking up next to the shrew from hell. We hadn't even been married a year prior. I found her in bed with a guy she went to high school with. My unit was in the field for training, and we were planned to be gone for a week, but we finished it a day early. I was looking forward to going home and surprising Marcy, but I was the one who was astonished. I could hear them from the moment I went into the modest apartment we shared off base. I walked into the bedroom to see a scrawny, long-haired, scraggly-looking maggot between her legs, hammering for all he was worth. I was enraged and kicked him all over the flat before throwing him out the door. Marcy cringed under the covers as I returned to the bedroom for her. Please, Jeff, do not hit me, she implored. I shake my head. I was raised not to strike a lady and I wasn't about to start now. Even though I wanted to punch her in the face, I grabbed a couple of luggage and threw them on the bed. Get out. Just pack your bags and get the hell out now. She packed her belongings as I grabbed a beer and waited. She finished. She came out into the living room where I was sitting. I apologize, she said. I never said anything but pointed to the door. She called her parents and they arrived to pick her up. I informed her father, who was also a Marine, what I had gotten myself into. He shakes his head. I apologize, Jeff. I thought we had raised her better than that. They whisked her away and I never saw her again. Fortunately, the next day I filed for divorce. I was startled when she agreed to my requirements, and our marriage became just another statistic. My unit was shipped to Vietnam just in time for the Tet Offensive in February 1969, a few months after I filed for divorce. I wish I could claim I fought them all back with a pig's jawbone, but I can't. To be honest, I was the one who received a beating. An enemy bullet ripped through my upper left leg and another struck me in the abdomen. They saved my leg, but warned me I'd have to go to physical therapy for a while. I also had to go through many procedures to repair the damage to my stomach. I was eventually sent to the United States and arrived at Balboa Naval Hospital the next day. I awoke to see Wendy standing over me. At first I believed I had died and gone to heaven. I will never forget her first words to me. What are you doing in my hospital? What about Jeff Hammond? She asked, smiling. Is this a ruse to get me to go out with you or something? You can't blame a guy for trying. I noticed she had to shave on her white uniform, which made her a petty officer. Second class. I see you've made second class. She nodded her head. Yep. And if I am not mistaken, that means I am higher in rank than you, Corporal. I grinned for now. I said... I realized she didn't wear a wedding band, and a part of me was relieved. Now, how are things going with you? Have you met anyone yet? Nope. I guess you've spoiled me for anyone else, she replied with a smile. Now, Corporal, you need to rest. I understand they're going to start your physical therapy soon. Will I see you again? I asked. She flashed me a sneaky smirk before responding. You'd better believe it, Marine. I'll be monitoring you like a hawk. I couldn't help but give a wide, munching grin. That was the best news I'd heard in a long time. She looked around for a moment before delicately kissing my cheek. Take care of yourself. I will check on you later. She maintained her word and arrived about the time my food was delivered to my room. She stated her shift had just ended and she wanted to see me before leaving for home. 
We sat and talked while we both ate the supper on my tray. After she inquired, I informed her about my failed marriage to Marcy. She listened quietly, then took my head in her hands. She was foolish and stupid. You deserve so much more. We talked until she was informed that visiting hours had ended. I stopped her before she could leave the room. I thought about you a lot over there, and I said. She gazed at me for a moment. There was sadness on her face. I've been thinking about you virtually nonstop since our last date. Perhaps if I had not pushed you away... She began before her eyes welled up with tears, and after wiping them away, she raced out of the room. What was that about? I wondered. Surely she did not blame herself for my injuries. I saw her a lot over the next six months. She came to my room at least twice a day to check on me. Even when she was off duty, she spent a lot of time outside in her wheelchair so that I might enjoy a smoke. We talked for hours about one topic or another. When she wasn't on duty, she would wear her shorts. I realized how much I enjoyed looking at her legs as time passed. I knew I loved her, and there was no denying it. I knew she felt the same way, but something was holding her back. I decided to bring up the topic one day when we were outside. I told her how I felt. She spoke with tears in her eyes. Jeff, I adore you too. Then let them marry, I said. She looked down for a bit before speaking. But you do not understand. What do you understand, my love? Is there anyone else? She shakes her head. No, there never was. I do not comprehend. I can't have children. She revealed that she was diagnosed with Turner Syndrome, which affects around one in every 2,000 women born in the United States. This explained her small stature and, according to her, impacted her ovaries, making it impossible for her to conceive. Worse yet, she claimed, there is no cure. I could tell this disturbed her, but I reassured her that my love for her was not dependent on her capacity to bear children. She cried as I hugged her tightly. But you deserve a complete lady who is capable of bearing children, she said. I took her face in my hands and looked her in the eye. You're a whole woman. When the time comes, we can adopt. There are many children out there who need a good mother. Oh, look at me. I was adopted and I came out fine. She grinned sincerely. Were you adopted? Yeah, my birth parents died in a vehicle accident when I was only six years old. My aunt and uncle adopted me as their own. You mean you'd allow us to adopt a child? She asked. Perhaps two children? Who knows? She grinned and placed her arms around my neck. I love you, Jeff Hammond. Wendy, I adore you too. So, will you marry me? Hell yeah! She exclaimed, drowning my face in kisses. I will be the best wife a man could possibly have. After a few minutes of fierce tongue wrestling, I looked her in the eye. Just curious. Is this why you hadn't wanted to date me before? I asked. She glanced at me with tears in her eyes. Yeah. I was worried you'd despise me if you discovered the truth. I would never hate you. To be honest, I fell in love with you the instant I saw you. Really? She asked. Really? In fact, I knew then that we would marry. Married? She placed her arms around me and continued to kiss me. I felt the same way. I was simply too terrified at the moment. By the way, you should know that I am still a virgin. That startled me. I assumed that a woman as attractive as she was would have guys pounding on her door. Excuse me, it should have been Hatch. She was Navy after all. Seriously? I asked. She nodded her head. Yep. I promised my parents before their deaths that I would save myself for my marriage. And this is exactly what I did. Why are you upset because I am not a virgin? No, that's stupid. You only have to vow to be gentle on me on our wedding night. I smiled at her before responding. I promise I eventually got to the point where the service thought I could get around. Okay. So long as I used a cane and didn't put too much weight or pressure on my wounded left leg, I lost a few parts of my abdomen. But the scars had healed, and there was no more damage in its infinite wisdom. The Marine Corps ruled that because I was medically unsuitable to serve in combat... I would be granted a medical discharge under honorable terms, which meant receiving a tiny monthly stipend. Wendy and I talked about it, and she offered to let me remain in her apartments because her most recent roommate had been transferred to another duty station and didn't want to be separated from her for even a day. I accepted. Furthermore, we were slated to marry in January 1970, which was only a few months away. So I moved in with her and remained in the second bedroom, which her previous roommate had utilized. 
Wendy was emphatic that we should not sleep together until we were married. It took a long time to make love to her, but I honored her requests. In the end, things were tight. I wasn't making as much as I used to, but Wendy was very organized and managed to make it work. She only requested for a small amount from me to help with the utilities. I was delighted to do it for her. I informed my family in Wichita Falls, Texas. They were ecstatic to hear that Y and I were getting married and agreed to come out. Dad suggested that I get a new truck, because my previous one had a manual transmission. I told him I couldn't afford the payments for a new one, but he wouldn't hear it. Call it a wedding present. We'll utilize it to bring your belongings out and then fly back. He also suggested that I contact the local bank where I had a savings account and arrange for some of the monies to be transferred to California once I married Marcy. We had a credit union account on base, but we closed it and divided the proceeds when we separated. I opened a new account with a civilian bank in town with my share of the money and have had monies there ever since, since that is where my checks were deposited in the great scheme of things. It wasn't much, but with the money I had sitting in Texas, it would definitely bring us over the hump. I knew I couldn't sit in Wendy's place all day doing nothing and wanted to say no. I needed something that paid real money. Wendy, on the other hand, suggested that I use the opportunity to look into local universities and get my degree using my GI Bill because I didn't have a car. She allowed me to use hers as long as I drove her to and from work. Thankfully, her car was automatic. I looked at nearby universities and, after consulting Wendy, decided to pursue an engineering degree. Classes would start roughly three weeks following our wedding, which suited wonderfully. I made the appropriate arrangements with the VA, filed the paperwork, and it was all done. We married in a short ceremony at a chapel close to Wendy's workplace. Many of her colleagues came out to wish her well, as did my parents, who fell in love with Wendy. My father had arranged for us to stay in a luxury hotel in Las Vegas for our honeymoon, so we were going after the wedding. I wish I could say that we screwed up like rabbits on our wedding night, but we didn't. That first night, I had no doubt Wendy was a virgin. That was new to me, but I did not complain. I also discovered that foreplay and oral stimulation were essential components of sex with Wendy. Plenty of it. I was certainly up to the challenge. It also helped that the doctor had given her hormones. It was slow at first, and I had to practice patience, but it was well worth it once she warmed up and began lubricating. Katie was blocking the door. She startled me by trying to give me a BJ. She'd never done it before, and it showed. I did not complain. She lacked experience. She more than made up for her eagerness. She vowed she'd improve. And did she ever? Wendy realized, much to my delight, that she preferred to be on top. This allowed her to manage how much she could take at once. I appreciated it for a number of reasons. The first was that my left leg was still weak and could not bear much weight for an extended period of time. We had a great time in Vegas and returned refreshed and ready to begin our new lives together. The first four years were difficult because money was scarce, but Wendy was able to stretch every dollar, and we always made ends meet. In her opinion, she re-enlisted in late 1970 for four more years, giving me enough time to finish college. It was a commitment to both of our lives. She also converted the old guest room into an office so I could study in peace and quiet. She managed to save enough money to buy an old desk and bookshelves from a local thrift store. She had them brought to her apartment and refinished them so when she was finished, they matched. She seemed to have spent a small sum on them. I still have that desk and those bookcases, and they look just as nice as when Mom initially acquired them. Wendy would amuse us many times as I sat and studied in my office, either with her piano or violin. I enjoyed hearing to her play and would occasionally get out my grandfather's old guitar or my mountain dealer to accompany her. We were never really good, but we had a nice time anyhow and the musical breaks have frequently turned into foreplay, which has eventually led to love interludes in the master bedroom. During those early years, we made an effort to save enough money to go on a date at least twice a month. During one of these outings, I saw another side of my wife. Wendy appears to be the most beautiful female I've ever seen. I've learned. So did a couple other men, some of whom worked at the same hospital as she did. One of them happened to be in a nightclub, Wendy and I occasionally visit with my leg in the condition it was in. I could not dance for very long at a time. Even then, I could only do slow dances. Forget about hopping around. It was just not going to happen. Wendy, on the other hand, enjoyed dancing quickly and was frequently invited to dance by other men in the club. 
She always asked for my approval first, and I generally gave her the go-ahead after the fellow had asked her. I also kept an eye on what he was doing while they danced. I trusted Wendy, but not the guys that approached her on the dance floor. One night, a guy approached our table and began speaking. My wife left without a word to me. Wendy recognized the insult and introduced him to me, explaining that I was her husband. He shook my hand cautiously, saying, Good to meet you. Do you mind if I dance with your wife? I looked at Wendy and saw she wanted to dance, so I nodded as they did. I observed him attempt to grab for her many times, but she backed away. I took a sip of my beer and noticed the activity on the dance floor. When I looked up, I saw him on the floor looking up at her. She stood over him, puzzled. The others paused to observe what happened between them. I took my cane and went over to them. Do not touch me like that again. Have you heard me? The whole... She was yelling. I knew she had a temper, but I'd never seen her this mad. You. He let out a growl. I'll get you on this. When I went to them, I pressed the end of my cane against his Adam's apple and slowly pushed him down. If I were you, I'd stay exactly where you are. Host, don't piss her off any more than you already have, and you certainly don't want to irritate me. Maybe you should attach a leash to that woman cupcake. What in the hell is going on here? I asked myself the question. I would absolutely need to talk to my wife. I pressed harder against the cane. Perhaps you should stay away from my wife. Otherwise, I might have to cut off your balls with a dull butter knife. He paled, but did not say anything. Wendy was still red-faced as I turned to her. Are you all right? I questioned her. She said, I'm okay now. I nodded. Maybe we'd better get moving. I spoke. Let's leave here, she responded. We returned to the table, got our belongings, and headed for the car. What exactly was that about? I asked her once we were in the car. I apologize. He works in a hospital. I dated him a few times before we got together, and I suppose he thought that gave him the right to move in with me. What occurred on the dance floor? I inquired. He placed his hand on my hip. So I'll need him in the balls. Years ago, an ancient master chief taught me this move. That was a good decision. Move. Kneeing him in the balls. What exactly did he mean when he referred to me as a cook? He's an asshole who believes he's God's gift to women. That's how he addresses any man who is with a woman he wants. I have never cheated on you, and I never will. That is something you must be aware of. Okay, case is closed. Good decision. The reality is, I knew she was correct. I remember seeing him around the hospital and observing how he interacted with other women. I was honestly amazed he hadn't gotten his buttocks kicked for the way he came on to the married nurses. I was also familiar with Wendy's reputation at the hospital. She was as honest as they come. I loved how you handled it. Kane putting it on his throat like that. Would you have cut off his balls? She inquired. I burst out laughing. You don't want to know, do you? I inquired. Now it was her time to chuckle. Not exactly, but it is comforting to know you are there to defend me. Please take me home now and make love to me. Yes, ma'am, I said, walking towards the home. Wendy was there to cheer me on as I graduated with my bachelor's degree in 1974. I found a job with a local aerospace business and am still there. But I plan to retire very soon. Let me tell you, it felt wonderful to finally contribute to our finances. Wendy had always been so supportive of me that I wanted to do something special for her, especially since her birthday was approaching. So I took the sign-on bonus I received, combined with the rest of my Texas funds, and scheduled a five-day trip to Hawaii. I showed her the tickets, and her eyes widened. She got time off from work and we flew over. She astonished me when she bent over and spoke into my ear. When we arrive at the hotel, I am going to blow your mind. She was true to her word. She wasted no time removing her clothing. When we arrived at our room... She looked stunning, standing naked in front of the window. She led me to the bed, undressed me, and then gave me an amazing BJ. She had gotten much better at this over time. I'm just getting started with you, Mr. Hammond, she added in a hopeful tone. We started making love. Do me, she groaned. My husband, keep doing me, do not ever quit. Who was I to dispute with? This feels wonderful, she murmured in my ear. I couldn't recall her ever being so happy, and I was determined to enjoy it as long as possible. This went on for what seemed like eternity after we were both exhausted. She rolled off of me and onto the bed. Who is this woman, and what did she do to my wife? 
I asked myself the question, who really cares? I thought about answering my own question. What exactly happened? After a while, I started to enjoy the little performance she was putting on. She chuckled like a wicked girl and gave me a mischievous smile. Except for dinner. We stayed naked and made love for the majority of the night before falling asleep in each other's arms early in the morning. We had a great time the remainder of the week, even making love in broad daylight on a remote beach. All good things must come to an end, even this vacation. We flew home, relaxed and energized. We regretted leaving for Hawaii, but vowed ourselves we'd do it again someday. Wendy chose to join the Naval Reserves after her enlistment expired later that year. She had been promoted to Petty Officer First Class by that point, and she didn't want her eight years to be wasted. She was given a job at Scripps Memorial Hospital and accepted it six months later. We decided it was time to buy a house, so we located one that we both liked, a two-story, four-bedroom home with everything we desired. The stairs were a bit of a challenge for me, but since Wendy adored the area, I figured it was a little inconvenience. It was around six months later. We began talking about adopting a child. We contacted various agencies who explained the procedure and showed us images of youngsters awaiting adoption. It was quite painful to see these children waiting for someone to take them in. We instantly fell in love with Michael and Michelle, eight-month-old twins who are now in a foster family with several other children. We began the process, went through all of the hoops, and became the proud parents of Michael and Michelle, two gorgeous children who grabbed our hearts from the moment we met them. Wendy was initially terrified, but she quickly adjusted to her new role as mother. I, for one, was relieved to be done with the tube. I had two beautiful children and a happy wife. Was there anything not to feel joyful about? Sure. We had to change our lives to accommodate the kids, but so do all new parents. We had to change our schedule slightly to suit the children, and we didn't want them in daycare. So we looked at our budget and determined that we could afford to hire a part-time nanny to care for kids while we were at work. When I arrived home one day, Wendy was crying in our bedroom. What is wrong, sweetie? I inquired. The youngsters addressed me as mama. Isn't that a nice thing? I inquired. She gave a nod. Her head was on my shoulder as she wailed. That is correct. I never imagined someone would call me that. As I hugged her, tears rolled down my cheeks. I knew how much it meant to her. Michael developed into an excellent athlete and began participating in sports at a young age. I really enjoyed taking him to Little League and seeing him play. We all want to see him play. After that, we would head out for pizza or burgers. Michelle, like Wendy, wanted to play the piano, so we paid for lessons and watched her recital. I enjoyed listening to the two of them perform duets on Wendy's piano, which was prominently displayed in the living room. Michael decided he wanted to play the guitar, so we purchased one for him and paid for lessons at the same time. When Dad decided I needed to widen my musical horizons and gave me a wonderful Gibson banjo knowing how much I liked bluegrass, I began taking lessons and enjoyed playing the instrument. Within a year or two, I discovered I could play a halfway decent melody on it. We had already created an informal family band and were frequently jamming in the living room, I'll never forget the time Michael and I played dueling banjos at a neighborhood picnic. Everyone was pounding their feet and clapping toward the end of the game when we finished. Michael and I exchanged high fives while the audience applauded us standing up. What I didn't realize was that Wendy had captured everything on tape. Life continued on, with all of its ups and downs. Things were going well for us overall, and we had little problems like any other family but we always worked through them in 1986. Wendy has thyroid cancer. She reassured me that it was a common and manageable issue, but I remained concerned and wondered if it was related to her Turner syndrome. She went through it fine, as she had promised, but four years later she had to take thyroid medicines every day. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, Wendy and several other members of her reserve unit were summoned into active duty and deployed to the USS Mercy, a hospital ship headquartered in San Diego. She had just been promoted to senior chief petty officer after serving in battle. I was understandably concerned for her health. Of course, the kids were afraid as well. But she put our fears at ease by explaining that hers was not a combat job and that attacking a hospital ship was considered a war crime. 
It was a tearful parting that day in August 1990 when the kids and I drove her to the ship after kissing and hugging her goodbye. She vowed to keep in touch as much as possible. As we saw her sail off to battle, the children and I both shed tears. She kept her pledge and called it at every opportunity. We wrote letters at least three times a week, and she called us from the ship around twice a month to let us know she was all okay. The holiday season, however, was the most difficult aspect of the entire experience. The kids and I missed her so terribly, but we made it through. She requested Thanksgiving and Christmas, and the kids and I even played a Christmas song for her while she listened. But it wasn't quite the same without her. We finally received word in the middle of March 1991 that the ship would be departing the area of operations and returning to Oakland in April. We all jumped with pleasure when we heard the news. When the time came, my kids and I drove to Oakland to fetch her up. We covered her with hugs and kisses when she stepped off the ship, and I could see she was glad to be home. I'm not sure if the kids noticed, but there was something different about her after war. I assumed she was simply tired from her experiences. But after a few weeks, I realized there was something more going on. She appeared exhausted all the time and fought to get through the day. Little tasks exhausted her, and I found her catching her breath several times. I finally persuaded her to see a doctor and took the day off to spend with her. Following her examination, the doctor advised her to consult a cardiologist. After barely 30 seconds of listening to her heart with a stethoscope, he told us she needed surgery straight now. What other doctors had dismissed as a cardiac murmur throughout the years turned out to be considerably more serious. Her aortic valve was not functional and needed to be replaced. They ended up giving her a mechanical valve, which the doctor said would survive longer than her. They also prescribed Coumadin, a medicine that keeps her blood thin. She felt much better after that, but it was unusual to hear her valve click at night when nothing else moved in the house. A few months later, she began to exhibit menopausal symptoms, which we both suspected were caused by the Turner syndrome. Her joints were constantly aching, and she had a series of dramatic mood swings. She might be content and carefree, just for a moment, then start crying for no cause at all. A second later, she would be enraged at the world for seemingly nothing. Of course, her libido and our sex life both faded away. Her doctor tried everything he could for her, but eventually recommended a hysterectomy. She agreed to the procedure and spent five days in the hospital. She improved significantly afterwards. However, things were never the same. Our love for each other never faded, but our sexual lives essentially vanished. We tried several times, but the actual penetration was too painful for her, even with creams and loops. We tried to satisfy each other orally, but something was still missing. Life moved on and the kids graduated from high school in 1993, Michael was accepted to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, while Michelle was accepted to UCLA with the goal of becoming a doctor one day. Wendy and I said our goodbyes with tears as they went about their lives, and then our life as empty nesters began. We considered selling the property and moving into something smaller, but after seeing the escalating cost of housing, we decided against it. Not only that, but we had many wonderful memories in the home where we lived and reared our children— and we reasoned that one day we would be hosting grandchildren, so we remained where we were and moved on. Wendy learned a few years later that she had earned enough points to retire from the Navy Reserves, so she did it. She stayed with the scripts and submerged herself in her work one night. Wendy turned to me and said the words that no married man wants to hear. We should talk. What's the problem? I inquired. She said, Before you say anything, please listen to me completely. Okay, I said, growing nervous. Was she going to ask me for a divorce? I had no notion what was going on in her mind. Promise me you will not become angry. Okay, she inquired. I was becoming irritated by this point, but I kept my cool. Just talk to me, Wendy, I suggested. What is going on? I understand the last few years have been difficult. It has been difficult for both of them. We both do. And I understand it's been a long time since we've been able to do anything in bed. I can't blame you. No, absolutely not. Hello, this is me. It is all my fault. No, it is not your fault you had to have surgery, I said. But I can't please you anymore, she added, crying. And it's not fair for you to go without sex because I can't do it anymore. What exactly are you suggesting? I inquired. 
Perhaps you should meet another woman and have sex with her. She asked, What do you want, a divorce or something? Oh no, I adore you wholeheartedly. I simply want you to be happy. And if having sex with another lady is what is required, I am willing to let you do it. Would you like me to cheat on you? I inquired. I was shocked that she would even suggest such a thing, especially after what I went through with Marcy. She shook her head. No, I don't. It wouldn't be cheating anyway. Not exactly. You'd have my consent and would not be sneaking around on me. Besides, it is just sex. It was now my time to shake my head. No, dear, I won't do it with or without your permission. I made a promise to you in front of God and witnesses to love, honor, and cherish you in good and terrible times, during sickness and health. Furthermore, I promise to forsake all others until death do us part. I'm not breaking my vows, but I can't please you anymore, she murmured, tears streaming down her cheeks. It's unfair. You are entitled to be pleased, but I am pleased. I like every minute I spend with you. How can you be content with me? She inquired, weeping. I can't possibly make you happy anymore. I'm a failure. I'm scarred and unattractive. I'm not sure how you can endure looking at me. She burst into sobs. I knew her zipper made her feel unattractive, but I never said it. I pulled her close to me and rocked her while she sobbed on my shoulder. You're not a failure. You're certainly not ugly. You're the most stunning woman I've ever known, and I'll gladly compare scars with you. I never want to hear that again. You've made me the world's happiest man, and you managed to raise two great children while working and serving your country. You are the best wife and mother any man could possibly ask for. Never tell me you're a failure. You aren't. Believe me, I know a lot of women who couldn't compare to you. I apologize. I simply want you to be happy. That is what you deserve. You make me happy. Listen, let's make an appointment with the doctor and see what we can do, okay? I don't want to visit another doctor, and I'm sick of taking medicines. That is something I can relate to. I completely understand. Stand. However, finding out is not a bad thing. Please call the doctor tomorrow and schedule an appointment. Please promise me. She nodded. Okay, I'll do that. She contacted the following day and scheduled an appointment for later that week. I took a comp day off to accompany her. The doctor and I both listened as she described what was going on. He took notes while she was speaking and waited for her to finish. He then reviewed her chart before speaking. I see you took hormones before your hysterectomy. Do you still take them? Wendy shook her head. They took me off of them and said I wouldn't need them anymore, she stated. He nodded. I see. It has also been a while since we examined your thyroid Latin. Given your history, get some blood tests done first to see what we are dealing with. I would also like to check your glucose level. My office will contact you within a day or two, and we will take it from there. Okay? Okay. She spoke. After the doctor left, a nurse entered the room and collected several vials of blood. We departed and returned home after stopping for a brief bite to eat a few days later. The doctor's office has phoned. Some of her readings were abnormal, especially her thyroid. Therefore, the doctor issued a new prescription. He also discovered that her glucose levels were raised and established that she was diabetic, although not severely enough to require medication. His intention was to discover if it could be controlled through diet. This didn't surprise me. I began researching Turner syndrome on the internet, and several websites said that diabetes was rather frequent among women with the disorder. I also took notice of the symptoms described and saw that Wendy had showed many of them over the years. The doctor also prescribed a new hormone for therapy and scheduled her appointment with his nutritionist. He also instructed her to return in 30 days for a follow-up. I picked up her new medications and planned another day off to accompany her to the dietitian. I intend to go on the diet with her, partially to support her, but mainly to avoid diabetes myself. It took a few days for us to see benefits from her new routine, but it was well worth it. Wendy's mood improved significantly, and she was nearly back to her old self. Wendy met me in the bedroom about a week after starting the new diet and taking her meds. It had been a long time since I had seen this. Do you want to play? She inquired, making a provocative pose. I held her in my arms and kissed her. Always, I stated. I attempted to undress, but she stopped me. Let me take care of it, she offered, unbuttoning my shirt. After removing my shirt, she removed my belt and unzipped my pants. I did not want to hurt her after all and it was the most we had accomplished in a long time. She leaned over me as she began to have sex with me and looked me in the eyes, 
This is incredibly satisfying. I've really missed this. Yes, I agree. You're incredibly hot. Do not quit doing this. I won't. In fact, I may just shackle you to the bed and be nude for the rest of my life. Works for me. After a few more minutes, I exploded inside her, and her climax occurred simultaneously. I felt like I could go on for much longer and began moving beneath her, but I noticed her face grimaced, just a little. I'm sorry, honey, but I'm starting to feel sore, she said, rolling away from me. That's fine, I said, keeping her close to me. No, very near to me. I have to apologize. I'm pleased you didn't take up my idiotic offer, and so am I. I told her she could kick my buttocks if I mentioned it again. She said, I might just take you up on that. I love you so much, she added, before kissing me deeply. I love you more, I said after we kissed. It felt wonderful to have the old Oni back. Our sex life has greatly improved. We weren't as active as we were when we first got married, but it was still incredibly fulfilling in 1997. Michelle completed her bachelor's degree and prepared for the next step in her studies. After watching Katie receive her diploma, the three of us went to Annapolis to see Michael graduate from the Naval Academy as a newly commissioned ensign. He introduced us to several of his classmates, and several of them thanked Wendy and me for our assistance. We acknowledged their gratitude and congratulated them on their accomplishments. I then asked Michael what he planned to do. I'm going for the jets, he said. I am going to be a pilot. I questioned him. I am going to be a naval aviator, he informed me with pride. After we celebrated our children's graduations, we returned home, and Michelle stayed with us for the summer until she needed to return to school. She still had four years of medical school and a residency to go before she could complete her degree. Wendy faced one medical issue after another for the following two decades. She began to develop cataracts and underwent Lye's replacement surgery in 2005. Doctors discovered an aneurysm on her aorta, so she underwent another heart surgery to replace it. While there, the doctor revealed that she would need to have her mechanical valve replaced. So he installed a pig valve, which he stated would endure for the rest of her life. She spent the next 15 years coping with one minor medical issue after another. They discovered a lump in one of her breasts and proceeded with a biopsy. Luckily, it was not breast cancer. Doctors examined her, then her kidneys, and at one point were concerned that she was suffering from heart failure. Fortunately, we had adequate insurance that covered all of this. Otherwise, we'd have gone bankrupt. I remember reading that most of this could be attributed to her Turner syndrome, which, based on what I witnessed, could shorten her life by up to 13 years. At this time, I was grateful that she was still alive, and I treasured every moment I had with her. I could do it. By that point, I wasn't too concerned about sex or lack thereof. Simply having her in my arms was enough. She eventually retired from writing scripts and spent several quiet years at home. By then, both of the children were married. Michael had recently been promoted to commander and was in control of a fighter unit stationed on an aircraft carrier. He married a gorgeous girl he met in Maryland, and together they have two children. Michelle finished her residency and chose to join the Navy to work as a doctor once she was licensed. She was now a lieutenant commander stationed at Balboa Naval Hospital, where Wendy had previously spent much of her career. She had also married, but when she discovered her husband cheating on her with a nurse, she delivered him a well-deserved kick to the balls. After her divorce, she began dating another doctor, but nothing significant developed between them. Then that occurred for some time. Wendy had been having difficulties breathing and swallowing her food. It got to the point that the only way she could sleep was with her head up. One night in October 2019, she woke me up furious. I could tell she was struggling to breathe, so I tried to calm her down. Nothing helped, and I could tell she was clearly in pain. So I dialed 911. The ambulance arrived quickly, and she was taken to the emergency department. I followed following and dashed inside as they wheeled her into the exam room. They examined her while I took care of the paperwork. I'd done this many times before, so I felt like an old pro. After what seemed like an eternity, a doctor came out and informed me that they had discovered a lump in the back of her throat that was preventing her from breathing correctly. They took a sample of the mass to determine what it was and placed her on a machine that allowed her to breathe. I asked if I could see her, but they stated she was drugged at the time. I waited, and we waited some more. 
I drank one bad cup of coffee after another. As I sat waiting for someone to say something, I drank so much coffee that I needed to use the restroom several times. I even dozed off while waiting for them to tell me what was going on. The doctor eventually came out and led me into a small conference room where we could talk privately. He then informed me that the mass appeared to be cancerous, and they were preparing her for emergency surgery to remove the mask so she could breathe. He also informed me that they were still analyzing it to see if the tumor was malignant. He warned that the surgery might take a long time, so he suggested I go home and give the nurse my cell phone number so I could be notified when they were done. I took his advice and left my cell number before heading home. When I got home, I was exhausted but also anxious. I called into work to let them know what was going on, and my supervisor told me to take whatever time I needed. I collapsed on the couch and slept fitfully until my phone woke me up several hours later. When I arrived at the hospital, I was taken to the recovery area and asked to wait until her room was ready, while I was waiting. A doctor came out and informed me that the cancer had been confirmed. They were confident that chemotherapy could treat the cancer, despite its aggressive nature. I signed all of the paperwork necessary to begin her treatment and went to see her. My heart shattered when I saw her in that hospital bed. She appeared haggard and worn, but maintained a brave demeanor. I cupped her hand in mine and kissed her cheek. Have you heard from the doctor yet? I inquired. She nodded. Will you be okay? Yeah, she said weakly. I'm just concerned about you. I will be fine, dear. I am right here. I'm not going anywhere. We sat there holding until she finally drifted off to sleep. I kissed her on the forehead and went home after the doctor said they were going to keep her for a few days to get her set up for chemo. My supervisor understood the situation and told me to take whatever time I needed. I had a lot of vacation sick and comp time saved up, so I took it and made the necessary changes in the house so she wouldn't have to navigate the stairs in her weekend condition. The next three months were rough. Fortunately, the kids came out for the holidays, and Jennifer, Michael's wife, cooked the holiday meals with Michelle's help. By this time, Michael was a captain in the Navy and commanded a carrier air group. He took enough leave so they could spend Thanksgiving and Christmas with us. Wendy and I spent as much time as we could with the grandkids. It was just after Christmas when the doctors discovered her infections. They immediately stopped the chemo until they had settled on a plan of action. You know the rest. The children were an absolute godsend. They helped me arrange the funeral and deal with Wendy's final arrangements. We all cried on each other's shoulders during this time. It was two months after the funeral when I finally decided to tackle the last of Wendy's things. By then, almost everything else had either been given away as she wished or donated to goodwill, with everyone locked down due to this damn coronavirus thing. I figured this was just as good a time as any to get to it. I went into the bedroom and looked at the large hope chest that ran the width of our bed. I had made it for her 45 years ago when we first moved into the house using the table saw and router she had given to me as a housewarming present. Until now, I had never opened the thing, so I had no idea what she kept in it. I remember asking her what she used it for, and she would simply give me a sweet smile and say it was a place for her best memories, whatever that meant. I figured she kept some knickknacks or things that had been handed down to her over the years when I opened the chest. A part of me felt like I was invading her privacy. I looked inside, wondering what I would find. There was an envelope sitting on top addressed to me. I set that aside for a moment and went through what she had placed in the chest. I found several notebooks and opened them up. Wendy had kept every picture the children and grandchildren had ever drawn and had inserted them neatly into sheet protectors. On top of that, she had kept every card letter and note she had ever received from us. There were several bundles of letters and cards from the three of us, and I found that she had kept every note I had given her over the years. She even kept locks of hair from the children that she had collected over the years. I also found a stack of videos she had made of the family, including a tape of the barbecue where Michael and I played dueling banjos. I decided I would make copies of them for the kids. I opened the letter and pulled out a handwritten note. I could tell this was fairly recent, as her handwriting wasn't as neat as it used to be. My darling Jeff, it began. I don't know if I'm going to survive this operation or not, so I wanted to get this off my chest while I still can. Over the last fifty years, you have made me the happiest woman on earth. 
and I only hope and pray that I have made you happy as well. Please don't cry for me. I've made my peace with God, and I'm prepared to meet my Maker with a clear conscience in the fifty years we've been together. You're the only man I've ever been with, and I know you've been faithful as well. I also know that you still have needs, so please find someone who will make you happy in your old age. Just promise that you'll remember me from time to time, okay? I'll be here in heaven waiting for the day when we're reunited forever. Your loving wife, Wendy, the note said. And conclusion. Tears ran down my face as I read that note three times, knowing it would be the last note from her I would ever read. I put the note back in the envelope and replaced it in the chest along with her memories. I closed the chest and decided to keep it closed and locked from that time forward. I looked up at the ceiling, wondering if she could see me. I love you, Wendy, I whispered into the room, and I always will. You were the best wife ever, and no one could ever replace you. Thank you for taking time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to tell about your or someone else's circumstance, please don't hesitate to contact me. Take care.